Say this to a man to have a healthy romantic relationship. And we're going to talk about seven crucial topics. You know, it occurs to me that humans are rather naive when it comes comes to mating these days, because for hundreds, if not hundreds of thousands of years, we've relied on chemistry and bonding to maintain a healthy, happy relationship. And yet, it doesn't seem to work. Now, while we might temporarily bond with someone, we might temporarily feel that sense of chemistry, but it doesn't seem to go the distance. Why doesn't it seem to go the distance? Well, I think we can actually predict this very early on in the dating process, in the mating process. You know, ladies, I recognize how frustrating it is for many of you out there in the dating marketplace because it seems like you're meeting one broken man after another broken man after another broken man. And let me tell you, if you're talking to the men, they're saying the same thing. It's one broken woman after another broken woman after another broken woman. And yet this past weekend, I spent time with eight other gentlemen, of which six of them are in a relationship, five of them married, one of them uh, is in a significant relationship, he's moving in with someone, or with his partner, I should say. Uh, four of them met through a dating app, <laughs> or a dating site, I should say, so they're relatively newer relationships, less than 10 years old. Um, yeah, that's actually right. Only one of the guys has been married in our in our group. Only one of the guys was married for 25 plus years. So he has children with his wife. Um, why I'm bringing this up is there are a lot of good men out there. There really are. Now, I've often said most men are good guys. They're just bad daters. But I want you to know that good, good men right here exist, okay? It's just a challenge today, particularly for our demographic, that midlife demographic. And I always say midlife is after baby making years and before retirement, because roughly 75% of singles in the dating marketplace, and this is anecdotally speaking, are probably divorced. And with divorce comes the unraveling of the tapestry of a life we once had with someone else. And to reintegrate into our sovereignty, for ourselves, and yet many people are seeking companionship, connection, and sex, but they haven't truly reintegrated into themselves to be able to lean into a fully committed relationship. This is why when I work with clients, it's all about discernment. It's all about asking those deeper questions early on. Some of the things we're going to be talking about today, so you can determine, is he really a viable candidate? Now, I know many of you are frustrating because you feel like you just don't even have a viable candidate. You're not even getting up to the plate, so to speak. Because yes, meeting these days with our, data, or our apps and our devices is rather challenging. It is. I'm, I understand that like nobody. I mean, I, I mean, like anybody out there, I get that. That is just rather frustrating. And as we age, we come with it. We come with certain preconceived expectations that block us from actually meeting somebody that could really maybe go the distance with us. And I believe when you actually ask deeper questions of someone, it opens up their heart. See, we in dating, it's oftentimes surface. It's more so focused on how physically attracted two people are instead of asking questions that develop closeness, that develops bonding with another human being. And so we're going to talk about those seven crucial topics that allow you to potentially bond with someone that might go the distance with you. So what are those topics and when do you talk about these topics? I'm a believer the sooner the better when two people genuinely like each other. So, you know, well, first off, let's think about this. You've gone on a first date and you don't plan on ever seeing the person again. Probably not necessary to ask the questions I'm about to share. Okay. Although you could do it for simple practice, right? You could practice some of these things if you don't plan on seeing someone. Now, this is where it gets tricky. You like the guy but he's thinking he's not going to see you again, okay? Let's say that's the circumstance. 
Well, you still want to practice these questions because for a guy who isn't interested in you, might be again good practice. What about a second or third date? See, when I think when we get to a second or third date, and it's not based on physical, in other words, he's not in the hunt. You know, folks, I know you've heard this habitually from so many people. Men love the hunt and men love the chase. I just want to remind you, what do men hunt? Are they walking around going, I'm hunting for a relationship. I'm hunting for a relationship. Do they have their bow and arrow and I'm going to be hunting for my relationship? I've yet to meet the man that operates that way. Now, that's not to say most of the time when they're in the chase or hunt, they are driven by testosterone. They're driven by dopamine. They're driven by the chemical cocktail being released in our brain that makes us want to be physically intimate with someone. I'm talking about you get to the third date and you two people actually like each other. You're actually having real civil, intelligent conversations with one another. If you get to a third date with someone, by the way, if, um, if, you're, if sex isn't the primary driver of getting together, if that physical intimacy isn't the primary driver to get together, and there's some genuine connection there, this is a great time to start asking deeper questions early on if you want to explore a relationship. And I, and I think it's critically important to define right from the get-go is, and this isn't part of what I'm going to share, these seven crucial topics, but to define what does a relationship look like for you? Like, what does it look like? Or better yet, ask this question. How does it feel when you're in a really great relationship? I want someone to write that down. How, ask a man, how does it feel when you're in a really great relationship? And the follow-up question is, how will you know you're in a great relationship. This really sparks a more heart-centered response. How would it feel? I, I know for me, folks, you've been following my channel for a while. You know, I, I'm, I, I think of the idea that when you're in the right relationships, it feels juicy, it feels delicious. These words are intentional because to me, the sweetness of a relationship is like biting into a fruit that just tastes so wonderful because it's ripe. That's how it feels from that perspective. In addition, and I think this is the most important aspect of what it feels like to be in a relationship, it feels safe to be yourself. You feel safe to just be yourself, not to have pretenses, not to have the stereotypical expectation of what it means to be a man or a woman, just to be your authentic self. So it's juicy and delicious and it's safe and comfortable. That's what it feels like for me. How will I know that? When I feel comfortable, when I feel excited. Ask yourself. Ask these questions of yourself. And so you've gotten to a third or fourth date with someone. There's some physical connection between the two of you. I think it's time to have some grown-up conversation. So here are seven topics you may want to consider early on to evoke deeper connection and intimacy. Deeper connection and intimacy. And I believe it was um, Esther Perel that coined intimacy. Into me see. In, I always say into me you see, but it's into me see. So first, I invite you all to identify what are your core needs in a relationship? What are your core needs? I have a need for closeness. I have a need for reciprocity. I have a need for trust. I have a need for respect. I have a need for physical and emotional intimacy. I have a need for play, just to name a few. Men oftentimes focus on the physical intimacy, so they'll ask sexual questions. But, you, you know, honestly, and I know men get judged for this. They get criticized and oftentimes crucified for wanting to know your sexual preferences early on. But again, you have to recognize that sex is an important need 
for success in relationships. So let's not be afraid of those sexual questions. Let's embrace it. I know it's kind of tricky because you just don't want him only about sex, only focused on sex. And yet, I think it's critically important to identify for yourself your most important needs. And you can share with someone, you know, before I'm before I fully commit to someone, I need closeness. I need reciprocity. I need trust. I need play. And this is how it usually looks for me when I'm in a relationship. I'm inviting you all to do a little bit of homework right now and sit with the question of what are your core needs? Because isn't that the whole point of being a romantic relationship is to have your needs met? Isn't that why you're engaging in this dynamic? I mean, if you unless you need someone to financially take care of you, your core needs is the most, probably one of the most important facets of a relationship for you. Number two, again, by the way, it doesn't have to be in this order. But I thought about roles. You know, we have this, we have, we have traditional gender roles that have been passed down throughout history. And I'm not a big proponent of gender roles but I am a proponent of roles. I am a proponent of shared duties, okay? And to leverage your strengths, to know your strengths and leverage your strengths, to know your weaknesses and see who can fill those. So many of you know I recently shared, I'm a terrible social planner. I just know this of myself. I'm just not good at it. Not that I can't do it, but on a consistent basis, it's just not my strength. I know this about myself. So ideally, I'm up front, like going forward, I'm, and as a matter of fact, I learned this in my last relationship, but going forward, I'm going to share with someone, this is not my strength. Is this your strength? And if it is, will you take on that role? You know, we think of things like who makes the bed and who pays the bills and all that kind of stuff. Let's get, let's get really into the heart of a relationship. And again, our traditional gender roles is probably one of the primary reasons why there's so much friction between men and women. I highly recommend reading the book, If the Buddha Dated. By the way, there's a link below to get a copy of the book, If the Buddha Dated. This throws out all the bullshit gender roles and says, how can we connect at a heart-centered level? And I'm going to mention one more book. This is a business book, okay? Oh, where is it? Um, here it is. It's a business book called The Partnership Charter. How to start out right with your new business partnership. Throw out, throw, put in the word romantic partnership. This is actually a great guide because it's like, how do two business people get together and form a partnership? You can apply this to romantic relationships as well. Again, there's a link below to get this book I recommend. All the books I recommend in the, in the show notes under Jonathan Recommend Books, okay? Identifying roles and re know what your strengths are and what your weaknesses are. I, I call them red flags. What are your red flags? But it's know thyself. When you know who you are, you can show up in relationship with much greater success, okay? Number three. Conflict resolution, conflict resolution. You know, these days it's easier to end the wrong relationship than try to work out differences. And I'm here to say is we all need help in communication. We all need education in this space. This is why I highly recommend reading the book, Nonviolent Communication by Marshall Rosenberg. But this is just a piece of the puzzle. You know, many of you know I watched Lewis Howe's The School of Greatness, and he talks about his relationship with his fiance and how one of the early conversations that they had was, would you be willing to do counseling on a regular basis, coaching, counseling, to help our relationship become stronger, better, you know, stronger, better, faster? <laughs> I'm thinking of the line from The Six Million Dollar Man. But 
That was a real intentional conversation he had talking about it because most it is impossible to be in a relationship without conflict. And so having these conversations about how was conflict resolved in your childhood with your parents and listen, because we model what we learn from our mother and father oftentimes. And folks, look, I told you earlier in this conversation where I, um, I, um, I was with my men's group. These are all men that are active listeners. These are, there are men out there that can listen and actually uh, articulate in a healthy way when there is conflict. I want you to know these men exist. I know a lot of broken men, they'll run from these topics that I'm talking about. I get it. But who you're going to invest your heart, that's who I'm, I'm more concerned about for you. And someone who's willing to do counseling, someone who's willing to work on this stuff, reading these books together gives you a greater chance of relationship success. Now, number five, no, number four, excuse me, money. Do you realize that 50% of divorces cite money as the primary cause for relationship, for divorce, or for divorce? So it's naive to act cavalier about money. But Jonathan, men are supposed to pay for everything. That's exactly the way it's supposed to be. I'm not going to contribute a dollar until we're married. Let me tell you something. That's a very naive approach. And if you don't, rec if you don't recognize that money plays a significant role even in the dating process, and I know you are being indoctrinated and some old beliefs, but I will tell you that a lot of midlife men do not have the resources to fully support even the entertainment of a relationship. And I would hate you to miss, by the way, remember everybody, two incomes is better than one. So would you, what, is it worth missing out on a relationship because you have an old paradigm driving the bus? Now, of course, you know, Men are going to pay those first couple dates. That's just kind of naturally, you know, we were raised that way. But you have to recognize that having a money conversation can make or break a relationship at some point. And I've heard from you women say to me, Jonathan, I don't want to be a nurse or a purse. So if that's the case, if you don't want to be a nurse or a purse, then it's important to have these conversations early on, especially when there's physical intimacy involved. I think it's, 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 if two people are going, now, here's the dilemma many of you face. The minute two people are physically intimate, I'm a big believer that they have that, well, we'll talk about this in a moment, but have a critical commitment conversation, okay? Folks, you know my narrative. Before the penis goes inside the vagina, you read my dating vows to one another. Where is my dating vows? <laughs> oh, it's downstairs. Um, you read the dating vows to one another. By the way, there's a link below to get a copy of my dating vows. But it's it's time to have, uh, the minute two people are, are getting to know each other and they're physically intimate, don't let men off the hook and say, oh, I just want to take it slow. I want it casual. Let's not put a label on it. Well, then don't let them into your vagina then. And money conversation is part of that. Number five, one, two, three, four, five, yeah, spirituality. You know, I don't think couples talk about their spiritual beliefs. When I say couples, I, I, I've noticed that it seems rare that dating includes a conversation about their, their beliefs beyond What's seen, if you will? I think it's critically important to, to get assessment. Do we share the same spiritual beliefs? When two people have opposing beliefs, it makes it more challenging. It's not to suggest it won't work. And, and it depends on how important those beliefs are to you. If those beliefs, if your spiritual beliefs are part of your soul or part of your life, then I think it's critically important to have this conversation. It might not be the most crucial topic, but I certainly would put on the list. What do you think is going to happen when you pass away? Think about it. You're investing in someone. 
It'd be nice to know what they think beyond the surface of this life. And, and if you can live with it. I know for me, it's critically important, and I invite you all to explore that as well. Number six, trust and commitment. I said it a moment ago. I'm telling you, the conversation about trust isn't just about fidelity. It's about, does, does this person have my best interest at heart? But really define what trust and commitment is. Even get a sense of how they feel about it prior to physical intimacy. because. Why go down? Why? I mean, what's the purpose of dating? If it's going to be short-lived, do you have a short-term mating strategy or do you have a long-term mating strategy? Those who follow me, it's, I hope it's a long-term mating strategy. In other words, you're, you're not going out on a date expecting it to end. I mean, well, of course it's going to end that evening. But in other words, you're not doing it just to go from one to the next to the next to the next, okay? You would like to settle down with someone. And I think it's important to have conversation. What does commitment look like for you? How will you know when you're ready for a commitment with someone? What's it feel like when you're fully committed with someone? Ask these deeper questions. And number seven, and it relates to commitment. What's your vision? What's your direction? What's your vision for your life? What's the direction for your life? Where do you see yourself with, in, in relationship or by yourself? Where do you see yourself in a couple of years? For many of us, we are in midlife. You know, it's like retirement. You know, um, there's a lot of people that, you know, may, can't afford to retire. There's a lot of different nuances, whether they're empty nesters, whether, whether they're going to have, you know, whether they have children that might have grandchildren. You know, I, I spoke to a woman who said, look, I'm, I just got out of a marriage. Um, and she doesn't have children and she, you know, she doesn't want to be a grandparent to someone else's children. She just said, I, I'm for the first time in my life, I want to play and I don't want that responsibility. She knows that about herself. And so she'll ask that question, how important are grandchildren to the men? And men should be asking that to women as well, because that's a factor to consider in your vision for your life. I'm just using that as one of many examples to explore. So just to recap, our seven crucial topics, needs, roles, conflict resolution, money, spirituality, trust and commitment, and vision or direction, whether it's shared or not. Did this content sink in with you? Did it resonate? Please let me know. Post a comment below. I'd like to hear your thoughts on everything. If it did and you like this video, please hit that like button. Please share this video. Please subscribe to my channel and hit that notification bell so you can be notified of new videos. And also, if you want to connect with me, right here is a link to schedule a discovery call with me to see if working with a coach is right for you. There's links below to join my group called Midlife Love Mastery, to follow me on Instagram, to get the books I recommend, to get my dating vows all in the show notes and in the first comment.